As a people, we have lost the art of reading and we are poorer for it. But new media can offer us new pathways to engagement. The American Religious Town Hall meeting is now in session. Welcome, friends, to the American Religious Town Hall Meeting, where the discussion of religious, political, and social issues is meant to promote the cause of religious freedom and to help us better understand each other. And now, here is your host and moderator. Hello, viewers. Thank you so much for joining us for an interesting conversation today. Um, my name is Andrea Luxton. I am the moderator, and I'm also the president of Andrews University in Michigan. I would like our team members to introduce themselves. I'm Bishop Michael Olson, and I serve as the Bishop of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Fort Worth. Hi, everyone. I'm Rabbi Dan Levin. I serve as Senior Rabbi at Temple Bethel of Boca Raton, Florida. I'm Tom Plumley. I'm the Senior Minister at First Christian Church in Fort Worth, Texas. We're a part of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. And now to our topic for the day. With the multiplicity of opportunities for communication, especially through social media and the internet, reading has become less of a cornerstone of our lives. Thoughtful, engaged reading with a text has been exchanged in many cases for sound bites, one-page reviews, and YouTube videos. While as faith leaders, it is our responsibility to find ways to communicate effectively with all the media and tools available to us, nonetheless, classics of religious thought still sit on our shelves, sometimes gaining significant dust before being picked up again. Study of the Bible and Torah themselves have also undergone changes. Deep reflections on passages of scripture, reading of biblical narratives for their richness, Engagement with the images of biblical poetry and biblical wisdom literature. For some in our faith communities, this is a lost art. Yet we may be the poorer because of it. With this in mind, the panelists today are asked to reflect on the following. Uh, what religious book would you encourage listeners to pick up and read? Why? What might we have lost in our faith journeys with the shift away from extended reading? Is there anything we may have gained? And finally, is there a technique you use that ensures your reading of the Bible, Torah, or religious literature that becomes an encounter with your God? Uh, that's, let's begin the conversation. Well, thank you very much. I, um, I, I think the, the way the question was phrased initially as far as the art of reading, uh, is that, I mean, uh, the time and the silence that it takes to, to engage a book and then also to reread a book or even to reread an article uh, to, and then to read it a third time uh, helps one develop an understanding. And I think it's certainly a part of scholarship, or at least classically so. One of the things that I, I think prompt, prompted my reflection on this was I forwarded a, uh, an article uh, that I thought would be helpful uh, to a friend of mine, and I, I, you know, did the social media, attached it to a text and texted him with it, and I got back uh, TLTR, and I'm like, what TLTR? And so I, wrote, I said, what does that mean? <laughs> too long to read. It's too long to read. <laughs> And, and, and I thought, well, but, you know, I thought it was long enough to write. And, you know, I mean, it's concise and it, it's, it makes it plural. And so it takes as long as it takes, you know. And, and I think that, that there's some uh, it, people still read in the sense that they have liter their literate grammar has changed. Uh, sometimes there's the, uh, the, the uh, socially acceptable spellings that don't don't quite uh, convey the language in it, but it's, um, it, it's, 
at base, it, reading has become just simply a matter of conveyance of information as opposed to communication. Uh, and um, what, one of the things where I saw this in, in religious life was where uh, I had some parishioners say to me, the most, most powerful, uh, I, I think the most powerful uh, depiction or communication of the passion was this Mel Gibson movie. And I said, well, really? Okay. And they said, we should do that on Good Friday instead of do the readings because it's that powerful in motive. And I thought about it, and I, not that I would consider it, but I was like, you know, that's, it's a conveyance of story and it's an, a piece of art in the same way uh, or a similar way that, um, uh, you know, Dolly's crucifixion or other depictions of religious scenes from the Bible that is the artist's expression, but it's not engaging the word, you know, as, as you know, Judaism, Islam, and the in Christianity, the Abrahamic religions are in, in many ways a, a religion of the word uh, and of the text uh, and uh, significant of it. And I think, um, uh, this this is at least at very least a cause for reflection, I think, on this. But as far as recreational and, and, and forming our imagination, uh, there's no substitute for reading. Uh, it can open up a whole other list of worlds uh, that are um, uh, th that help us to live and to flourish in this one. I, I don't disagree really with anything, uh, Bishop, that you shared. Um, Engaging with a book uh, is something that is in many ways irreplaceable. To be able to have that kind of an extended deep dive into an idea, we don't generally afford ourselves that. Uh, whether it's uh, a nonfiction piece of philosophical literature or even a novel, uh, we tend to want stories to be wrapped up more quickly. Uh, after the high holidays every year, I always pick out a novel to read that's going to be not really about anything that's, you know, useful, just something that I want to read because I heard it was a good book, generally takes me about five months to finish that book. I read it in such little snippets and little snippets. The most recent book I read was a book called The Overstory, which is this magnificent tale about these different lives and how they intersect around trees. Uh, it was a beautiful book, an incredible story. The writing itself was worth the investment of time beyond just learning the story. At the same time, we're really blessed in our day and age that there are other media that give us the capacity and the opportunity to engage in ideas in different ways. There is the adage that a picture is worth a thousand words. And there are things that can be communicated through television and through video that you just can't necessarily get from a book or from something of classic literature. I think about some of the really moving things that I've experienced in fiction and in nonfiction through cinema, through documentary, through Netflix, and the explosion of video content that has happened through streaming services that has really enriched my life, that, I, that literally often stories and, and moments that bring me to tears. Um, I'm also deeply uh, connected now to podcasts, where I have the opportunity to access a huge library of conversations around all kinds of different ideas that I would never have engaged in. I find myself in the morning while I'm shaving or getting dressed where I couldn't be reading. It's very dangerous to shave and read at the same time. Uh, but listening to a podcast and having the opportunity to be a part of a conversation and engage in ideas that way. I have other things to share, but Tom, maybe there's other things that you would share about your experience. Yeah, I wanted to, re to, re to reflect on the bishop's uh, uh, notion that, that reading uh, affects, uh, creates, helps us create imagination uh, and, and um, think that perhaps uh, we're replacing that with uh, a video game imagination. <laughs> uh, a, a world that comes to us uh, uh, with those kinds of characters. And, and really not so much us, but certainly, absolutely, uh, folks the age of my grandchildren um, uh, and my children. Um, uh, <laughs> The, the philosopher, uh, Renaissance philosopher, Rene Descartes, 
uh, said, and of course, this, this was at a time not too long after the inventing of the, the printing press. So, so books were, were becoming the, the means by which people were learning to communicate ideas uh, and reflections about life. And uh, he said, the reading of all good books is like a conversation with the finest people of the past. Uh, and it seems to me like perhaps now we're getting the Cliff Notes version of that conversation uh, in so many in so many ways. Now, frankly, I I, I agree with with Dan that um, uh, video presentations can be as inspiring uh, as as em emotive. Uh, uh, with good acting and so forth, uh, uh, and good writing. Um, uh, my wife and I do a lot of that together. Um, uh, and, and, and one of the things that we try to do is to stream things from, uh, from other countries uh, and, and get, get stories that are, that are created uh, in and acted uh, about things that are that are happening in other con countries uh, uh, whether it's whether it's India or Poland or Turkey uh, our, our kids laugh at us for for watching some of these things that are created in France and Germany and 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 Norway and and, and places like that uh, yet, It, it is an, an attempt to uh, uh, substitute uh, for, uh, for the reading that we once did. And I, I have, uh, I, I, I sit in my office at, at, at church and, and, and look at, at this wonderful bookcase that was created in uh, 1914, when, when our building was built, uh, for the senior minister's office, um, uh, and and it, it is great, and I have it filled. But the books I go to are in in a, just very few, a very, a very small percentage of of the ones that are there, and 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 I go to them. For reasons of work, rather than, uh, and sometimes reflection on things that I need to do or get done or prepare for or write myself, uh, rather than uh, uh, going in and, and reading or rereading um, uh, some some things that that uh, uh, that I picked up long ago uh, and. Because because I felt they would be important to me. You know, uh, th this is a fascinating topic to me because my background is being an English teacher, and so I admit to a level of bias here that uh, my life has been around texts and books and so on. And um, I I value also the, the, all the modern media. I think there's some amazing stuff out there, but I, I think the problem is comes back to that. TLTR, uh, too long to read concept. Because I think that, that behind some of this shifting, that is what is, that's some of the things that are driving it. And as soon as you get to that, everything you're reading is at a, a minimalistic level. You know, and, and the, the point is when you see a video or you see a, um, you're, you're always seeing a level of interpretation by the person that is doing it. Right. And I would even add, it seems like the those who do read, there's a current practice where they turn to blogs or exclusively podcasts or blogs and where people are commenting and sometimes with, with a, a presentation that, that uh, shows a lot of intelligence or some reflection and thought, but it's not peer reviewed. There's no 
there's no uh, text, uh, textual references, uh, footnotes, etc. And and then that gets repeated, and it gets repeated. And I think the habit of reading, uh, the difference between say a periodical or a journal and a blog is somehow lost. Uh, and I think that's also affected our um, our periodicals in media, not only in in television or even and what's presented in in podcasts uh, by some of our television news, etc. There's there's um, there's the, the the sense of readers holding the author accountable uh, is somehow lost, and it's just sort of a preference of opinion that that's really not rooted um, in anything else than it's my opinion and how it's presented, and I think that's um, that's troubling for us if we're going to try to form a society where we can, with, a, with a, a pluralistic society where we can live in in some sense of, uh, with diversity, but also where there's an under, uh, an underlying principle of unity that's in, in our basic, our humanity. And I, and I think that needs to be reaffirmed and, and stated again in the written word. And in the red word. Yeah, I think that there is um, something that's happened societally when we have lost long form journalism or long form debate, which is that we assume incorrectly that really, really, really complex situations can be simplified to a three minute package on the evening news. So for me, I'm more familiar perhaps with the complexities that surround the modern state of Israel and its history and its current condition. And it's really, really complex. When I bring our congregation to trips to Israel and we're in Israel for 13 days together and we're trying to learn ancient history and we're trying to learn modern history, the thing I say again and again and again is it's complicated. And if we think that we can only, you know, we have too long to read, right? Tell me the, what's the crux of it in, in a minute. You can't tell that story in a minute. You can't understand the complexities. And because we make judgments that even impact policy decisions about are we going to uh, support this or not support that, but we want it to be on the basis of something that we can understand in simple forms, there are a lot of things that you can't understand in simple form. And I think because we've lost long form journalism, we've lost our own ability to concentrate on something. Well, let me read a long article about that that can explore the complexity. We're deprived of that. Uh, and I think that that's dangerous. So, so maybe our lost art is not the art, lost art of reading, it's the lost art of critical thinking. There, there I think they go. go hand in hand. There you yeah. go. What, what does the President of the United States get every morning? A, what do we call it? A briefing, a document uh, that that is too long to read by by most everybody's standards but a briefing of basically everything that's going on in the world uh, 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 but someone digesting um, what they think the president needs to needs to hear. So is this an, an inevitability with the increasing complexity of the world and so much communication? Is it inevitable there, that there, things have moved this there's way? There's so much out there. Even even when Dan was talking about the selection of his of his novel that he wanted to read, he said it was because someone had suggested or or he had heard that it was a good book. Um, that that's you know. We, we have ways of determining what we want to read uh, and, and, and what we don't. The, the Library of Congress put out a, put out a, a study uh, and, and it started with, with really hurtful words. The, the, uh, uh, it, it started by saying, uh, I am not happy to uh, whoever the president of the Library of Congress, who, the executive director, whoever it was, that was writing it said, I'm not happy to be able to put out this, this report. And, and the findings were, were such that, that the, the decline in reading in, in America was such that, and, and, and really over the last 20 years, things have just gone, uh, 
um, in, in terms yeah, of Yeah, and I think you reading. see that with young people because a lot of their media is, so, you know, it's mind candy, right? You know, it's so addictive. Um, at the same time, I see lots and lots of people who are still participating in book clubs, who still commit to trying to read, uh, and they just read in some ways different things. In Jewish tradition, there is a, an idea of shared dialogue through study through Hevruta, where you make a commitment to hey, take an hour with a study partner and consider a text together in dialogue. And I try to encourage members of my congregation to take that hour to study. This is not a new problem. In Pirkei Avot, 2,000 years ago, the rabbi said, don't say, I will study when I have leisure. You may not have that leisure. They had to say that because people were making the same argument, oh, it's too long to read. That was true 1,800 years ago as well. Well, I think it's, um, you, you, to your point, and, uh, Andrea, it's... Um, I, I don't know as far as I, I think there's inevitably it we hit a bottom all right and I think uh, w without without uh, in, without someone doing long-term reading and and being able to teach and forming a community in that sort of way that you described um, we're going to be prone to being manipulated by our passions and also history open to all sorts of revisions, uh, which which is a dangerous way because then you're open to scapegoating. Okay. And I think that's a problem. Let's take a break. We hope you're enjoying today's program. If you'd like to learn more about the American Religious Town Hall, please visit our website at AmericanReligious.org. That's AmericanReligious.org. There you can read about the vision and history of the program and we invite you to become a ministry partner, explore our Town Hall Estates healthcare facilities, and view past programs by clicking the appropriate menu buttons. Each week, we look forward to receiving your letters. You may write us at the address shown on your screen. Send your letters to American Religious Town Hall Meeting, P.O. Box 180118, Dallas, Texas, 75218. If you have a prayer request, please send it to prayer request at AmericanReligious.org. Thank you for writing and thank you for watching. Now, back to today's closing statements. Welcome back, everyone. And uh, in our closing statements today, our, our panelists are going to, to share with you uh, maybe one of those texts that really you just got to get hold of. Uh, it's uh, What religious book would I encourage listeners to pick up and read? Um, there's a lot, but if I'm picking one, uh, it's it's a book entitled "He Leadeth Me" uh, by Walter Sishek. Uh, he leadeth me, uh, and it meant a lot to me when I read it. Read it on a retreat. Uh, it's it's about his story of faith uh, as lived in in imprisonment uh, in a Soviet gulag and how he was able to really maintain joy and hope. Uh, with the with the bare essentials of uh, of Christian faith, and it's it's a great, powerful insight not only in Christian faith but also in uh, human nature. Gee, what would I encourage people to read? Um, uh, I, I wrote down a couple of titles uh, that uh, I would suggest. Uh, uh, the first is I and Thou. Uh, by Martin Buber, um, uh, a, a, a very helpful uh, dialogue, uh, helping us to understand how we can address each other and regard each other in a better way. Uh, and the other, uh, was one that just continues to stick in my mind that I read a long time ago, uh, as, along with I and Thou, Black Elk Speaks, mm. uh, helping, helping us under, uncover some of the thinking of the people on whose land we now live. Mm. I had to read Black Elk Speaks in college. I remember that so clearly. Um, you took one of mine, Tom. I would have told I and Thou as well. 
Uh, two that I would encourage people uh, to read are Harold Kushner's classic, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Note the title doesn't say why bad things happen to good people. It's when bad things happen to good people. I think it's one of the most important books of theology written in the last hundred years, uh, and it's really accessible. Uh, the second that is more poetic is Abraham Joshua Heschel's book called God in Search of Man. Uh, it's amazing when you think about Abraham Joshua Heschel, who himself uh, grew up in Poland, was educated in Germany. Uh, English was his fourth language, and when you read the incredible eloquence of his prose, in addition to the complexity of his ideas, and you think that was the guy's fourth language, it gives you an idea of uh, the power of that man's mind. But each of those books um, helps us to embrace a connection and appreciation for God in ways that really expand the mind and the soul. Great, some good text there, and uh, I, I can add a, a couple of my own now. Um, uh, one that's uh, been many, very meaningful to me is Frederick uh, Buchner, uh, Telling the Truth, and uh, I find very powerful, um, and maybe particularly because it, it, it parallels it with, with um, a literature text that is very familiar to me, which is King Lear. Um, and I think that that is very powerful. Um, another one that I, I have found personally valuable is The Return of the Prodigal Son uh, by Henry Nowen. And uh, that one to me is, is powerful just because it's, it's the exploration of someone themselves in seeing themselves in, in different roles in, in, in the picture of The Return of the Prodigal Son, uh, you know, as the father um, and also the prodigal and the, and the son and exploring their own personal faith and personal faith journey. Right, the Charter of the American Religious Town Hall provides that Roman Catholics, Protestant, Jews, educators and others may appear on this program and can declare their beliefs without hesitancy. And the rest of the members of the panel will uphold and guarantee that American right to all who will appear, irrespective of race or creed, so that the rest of the world can see that here in America, we believe in civil and religious freedom, not only in theory, but in reality. So now, friends, until next week at the same time and over the very same channel, the American Religious Town Hall meeting stands adjourned. And may the God of all of us bless all of you. Until